Stay hungry, stay foolish. Before we launch into the finale of Gorillas Can Dance, I want to thank our sponsor, Zai. Zai is a global fintech boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded financial products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into part four of Gorillas Can Dance. Today is our final part. Unfortunately, I've really enjoyed this series with our guest. It is about the where, displaying what our guest calls the global mindset. We will also share today how such partnerships can help all of humankind and the challenges that we face. It is a pleasure to welcome back someone I've got to know and I feel a connection with. It's been great to get to know him. It's great to spend this time with him. He is the author of the brilliant book, Two behind me here, by the way, one up for grabs for you. Just sign up to the innovation show .io newsletter and you'll be in the hat to win a copy of that book. Gorillas can dance lessons from Microsoft and other corporations on partnering with startups. Shamin Prashantam, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Aiden. I'm looking forward to this final piece with you. And I just want to say because oftentimes people drop off and they don't come back listening to the show. It's been an absolute pleasure sharing this time with you, as I said in the introduction, and I've learned so much from your work and indeed enhanced by these conversations. So I want to thank you for your commitment to doing this and for writing this book as well, because we'll find out at the end of today's show, the real reason behind you writing this book. So my sincere thanks on behalf of our audience and me. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. Appreciate your kind words. So I wanted to remind Shamin, our audience, that partnering requires us to embrace these three mindsets. And it wasn't until I actually listened back and I edited the shows that I really, all these pieces came together for me. And the three partnerships are the entrepreneurial, the collaborative and the global as you suggest in the book. And you say in a post pandemic world, the global mindset might be the most important. Perhaps we might recap here before we launch into the where of the show, which is about this global mindset, about the three mindsets, because they're extremely important. And they can be used no matter what, if it organizations partnering with startups or not, they can be used on their entrepreneurship adventures, and can be extremely useful for individuals as well. You know, I'm so glad you brought this up at the outset. Um, I usually conclude with these three mindsets. And I, I but I, I really think, as you said, these are extremely important. So when we were talking about the why, why would corporations bother to engage with startups? What we were discussing was how it's so important to be entrepreneurial because of forces of disruption, uh, because of the need for more sustainability. I mean, we're in such a dynamic and complex world. Uh, you don't want to overstate the threat of disruption, obviously, but at the same time, it's a non-trivial one. So the need to be entrepreneurial, that's the why. And so that calls for an entrepreneurial mindset. And you can think of it in terms of being proactive, in terms of being innovative and willing to take risks, calculated risks. Um, but then when we were talking about the how, okay, so you recognize that it makes sense to do this, but how do you do this? And one of the key issues there was that there are these complementary capabilities that big companies and startups have, but the very differences that make it attractive to work together also make it challenging. One response would be to walk away. But the other, if you have a collaborative mindset, uh, a willingness to um, leverage networks actively, uh, discerningly, and reflectively, meaning being willing to learn from these, then engaging with startups makes sense. And we were talking in the in the last episode about the how in terms of addressing these asymmetries and building a capability to do that. But, you know, what has been the most fascinating for me and rewarding aspects of this research that I've conducted, and, and frankly, it's been a privilege, is that I've had a chance to observe um, startup and uh, startups and corporations partnering in different parts of the world. So my work began when I was in Scotland, um, and I was sort of looking both west and east from there, you know, Silicon Valley, 
but also things happening in India. But then later when I moved to China, I felt as if, you know, a, a whole new <laughs> uh, dimension had been opened up to me. Uh, and then I also had a chance to do some work in Africa where my school has a campus in Accra, Ghana. So you take a company like Microsoft, we spent the whole of the opening episode talking about them. This is a truly global company, and they engage with startups in different parts of the world. And this is true of Unilever. It's true of BMW. It's uh, true of a lot of other big companies uh, that I've studied. And the fact that you can tap into these fantastic uh, ecosystems of startups in different parts of the world. You know, Silicon Valley ain't the only show in town, or it, it isn't the only dance floor. Uh, and recognizing that there are so many possibilities in different parts of the world, but also the need to uh, suitably adapt and, and do things differently, I think is, is a big part of this, of what we're going to be talking about today. And that's the where. Uh, but for this, you need a global mindset. Uh, and I think in a world where now globalization is sort of going out of fashion a little bit, you know, there's a lot more sort of inward looking perspectives or actions, which is understandable in many ways. Uh, but all I would say is let's not look, uh, lose sight of the, the opportunity to tap into entrepreneurial talent around the world. Zooming into the global mindset, I thought how about how valuable the global mindset is for again, people working in large corporations. And it's the essence of the global mindset. It's getting out there, getting outside the building, as Steve Blank would call it, or just going and meeting people, connecting with people, etc. The essence of it. But there's three main components of the global mindset that you talk about curiosity, competence, and connections. And I thought we'd zoom in there a little bit before we get into the global mindset in action. As a starting point, you know, there needs to be this interest to learn about other ways of doing things, other perspectives on the same thing. Uh, because frankly, many people face uh, the same sort of uh, pain points and issues, but have different cultural assumptions or practices that lead them to approach them in different ways. And when you can approach things uh, with curiosity, then that increases the odds of finding out new things, which is critical for innovation. But then there needs to be some competence to be able to deal with other contexts, you know, because, um, well, if we want to get the benefit of the <laughs> curiosity, which is things are different, then you also need to be able to cope with uh, very different ways of doing things. Uh, and then there's the connections that actually help to bridge uh, these different contexts. And, you know, in fact, that can help to navigate these uh, differences. Uh, and the three can actually reinforce each other. Uh, and I think actually a lot of the people in your book um, that you talk about also represent this and, and your own life in terms of, you know, having experienced um, other parts of the world uh, in your career. And, and so many of the speakers on your program, I think, also reflect this uh, very well. Uh, and I so I, I think these are sort of the, the key elements of a global mindset. Before we get into the where I, I thought about just the ingredients of this, because I'm sure it's so haphazard for people. It's like, oh, I know somebody in China, or I know somebody in America. Oh, my friend Frank went to Silicon Valley, let's contact him. It's haphazard. And you give us this brilliant playbook in which to think about it systematically. And, and this is what I think is so important about your book. But I thought we'd zoom into the where now. And we won't do it justice, that's for sure. I highly recommend if you are thinking about partnering with startups, or you're a startup thinking about partnering with a gorilla, you have to read this book. It's simply a must read, it has to be on your personal curriculum to understand all the complexities and all the opportunities. And as Shamin has done, he saved you years, he may actually give you the success in the first place, because you will have avoided so many of the pitfalls that so many people will fall into. So I'm going to tee you up, Shamin, with a little quote, and I had so many to pick from here, but this one I thought was useful. And it goes as follows, the geographic aspect of startup partnering 
is one that is of great importance for large multinational corporations, as indicated by several of the examples used in the book so far. For corporations operating in multiple locations, there are opportunities to engage in meaningful corporate startup partnering all around the world. To make the most of their global partnering opportunities, multinationals would do well to pay attention not only to the prospect of partnering with startups around the world, but also actively consider the nuances associated with different types of locations. And in this section, you in depth share three perspectives once again, think global act local, think local act global, and think global act global. So I'd love you to take us through these at a high level. Again, bearing in mind, we won't give it full justice by the book to find out the full justice version. Well, thank you for all the, the um, kind things you had to say uh, about the book, Aidan. And, you know, uh, as you said, these are the three ways in which I think uh, companies can make sense of tackling the where. Uh, and these are not mutually exclusive. And in some senses, you know, I think uh, also uh, indicates a journey that many companies traverse. So as a starting point, the notion that you have to adapt startup partnering practices to different locations is a good place to begin. So that's the idea of think global, act local. Uh, many companies have uh, turned to Silicon Valley early in their efforts to partner with startups. Uh, this was true of, of Microsoft. Um, this was, and, and in fact, uh, that's not where their global headquarters is. Uh, they're based in Seattle, uh, in Redmond, uh, more accurately, but they chose to use their Mountain View campus. Um, and uh, the head of the campus, Dan and Lewin, began this process. Uh, SAP, the German company, when they decided to take startup partnering seriously, they entrusted this to a team in Palo Alto in California. And, and this is true of many other companies too. Um, but whether they did that or not, whether they started it in headquarters, there's often a set of global partnering practices that then you want to take to other markets. And the important thing is to realize, well, different contexts are different. So think global, act local. This is sort of the way in which global strategy was taught in the 1980s uh, and early 1990s. I think actually that principle still holds. You know, you look at McDonald's. Um, I remember during the horsemeat uh, scandal, the big trucks in, in uh, Scotland that said 100% beef on them. Uh, and I used to chuckle to myself and think if these McDonald trucks were plying in India, they probably have to say 0% beef because, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the mighty McDonald's don't have any beef burgers in India. You know, you have to adapt. And this is true of startup partnering practices too. So for example, uh, nowadays, many companies are conscious of emerging markets as being important sources of innovation, which wasn't the case, say, 20 years ago even. But then if you engage with startups in emerging markets, you may have to adapt some of the things you do. You know, uh, There's a lot of excitement, a lot of appetite, but some, sometimes you also find uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs are first time entrepreneurs, not as much experience with engaging with corporations as you might find in Silicon Valley or Israel. So maybe more hand holding, but also more nimble, agile ways in which to move faster. Um, Walmart, when they set up their startup partnering in China, one of the decisions they made was to say to startups, if you work on a pilot with us, it needs to be done in 60 days. And it wasn't to be tough on them, in a way it was to reassure them that this lumbering giant would move fast, which is what startups and emerging markets want. So that's the first bit, you know, adapting to these local contexts, think global, act local. But then you also have this idea of adopting practices and innovations from certain local contexts and deploying them more broadly in other markets, maybe even on a global basis. So that's think local, act global. Global strategy academics started talking about this from the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, 
Although at that point, most of the examples I remember reading were mostly in advanced markets of Western Europe, North America, Japan. Uh, now I think there's a much broader canvas uh, on which to play. There are more dance floors uh, around the world, including emerging markets. I think Israel has been a very interesting context in my uh, academic work. And a lot of companies have actually um, found startup partnering practices there that they've been able to take elsewhere. This was true even of Microsoft, uh, as we've talked uh, in the about in the opening episode. Um, and so, the, you know, there are certain contexts in which uh, startup partnering has been very sophisticated and some practices can be taken there, adopted from there, deployed elsewhere, but also innovations that are adopted in, in other markets can be deployed uh, elsewhere too. And uh, so, for example, Walmart, I mentioned having set up shop in, uh, or, or rather, uh, they set up shop in China a while ago, but they started engaging with startups a couple of years ago. They had um, a startup partner in Shenzhen, which had developed an AI-based solution to deal with a pain point in the Chinese market, which is when you go into supermarkets and buy loosely, loose vegetables or fruits, it's a little bit of a hassle. So they try to, to make that process easier. But then Walmart discovered, you know, this was very interesting technology that could be used back home, but in a very different, uh, for a very different issue, which was in-store theft. Um, so that calls for, you know, the things we talked about before, the curiosity, the competence, the connections, because you can find these interesting solutions in other parts of the world, uh, which can be useful not only there. And then the final piece, the think global, act global, this is about recognizing that, okay, if you're dealing with these different parts of the world, then to use the, the expression you did, you don't want to do this in a haphazard way. You want to systematize this. And one important way of doing that is to recognize the differences between locations and treat locations as a portfolio. So there is a clear difference between advanced markets and emerging markets. Uh, but also, a lot of the examples we've talked about typically focus on innovation hotspots, you know, Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv in Israel, Shenzhen in, in China. But actually, there's also innovation that happens outside of these innovation hotspots. You know, admittedly, most of the corporate startup partnering efforts will likely take place in innovation hotspots. But it would be a shame to miss out on what's happening elsewhere because uh, multinationals do, either for historical reasons or because of great policy incentives, do set up um, uh, operations off the beaten track, you know, Scotland, where my research started, uh, has a lot of these American subsidiaries that had set up manufacturing uh, plants after the Second World War when they were coming back into Europe. But now, uh, you know, aren't necessarily that competitive for manufacturing and wish to do more innovation work. One way to do that is to partner with local startups. But uh, partnering with startups in Glasgow, uh, which has a very, very uh, uh, close, uh, dear place in my heart, isn't the same as partnering with startups in Silicon Valley. Um, or, you know, a city like Ningbo in China, which many people may not have heard of, uh, but which has one of the busiest ports in the world, again, isn't the place where you would expect startups and big companies to engage. But I found IBM working with startups there very productively. So, you know, if you think about advanced markets, emerging markets, innovation hotspots, non-hotspots, uh, that gives you then this notion of a portfolio. And that's what I mean by think global, act global. Think of all of these different locations as potential dance floors. Recognize, though, you need to adapt what you're doing, but also that you can adopt interesting ideas and align what you're doing to the needs of the different locations. I love that. I love the idea of the different dance floors. It's like, uh, well, you need to learn the local dance for, for the certain <laughs> certain countries as well. But, but uh, absolutely, it drove me many ways because I was thinking about that. And I was kind of going, well, it's not just haphazard choice of a location to set up uh, 
innovation lab, for example, oftentimes it's driven by the the logical brain, the financial brain of an organization where it's like, we'll have a beauty contest from all these cities that will offer us tax breaks or countries where we'll go there because it's a tax break haven. And that's the wrong approach. According to your book from reading your book, you got to think about it more strategically more systematically as well. That was one thing then the way I thought about it. And one of the frames of reference I have is sport. I'll go back to one thing we said at the very start, which was by partnering with startups, it's almost like having an academy in a soccer team, for example, and it's like being able to spot the early talent, but also be able to spot the talent that maybe doesn't fit the way you play and sell off that talent and actually make money and invest more in your own talent again. That was the other way. But the real thing that this section taught me was, sometimes you see this and many of my friends have done this where they've gone and coached in different countries. So they're Irish, they've gone and coached in different countries in rugby. And they find the culture difficult to adapt to in those different cultures, because they have different ways of playing, the clubs are managed in different ways. And they have to try and get their mi mindset and their mental model around this new culture. And as we know, culture is everything when it comes to organizations. And that's something that I found here. It's like, if you don't fully understand the culture of the city or the country you're going to, that can be one of the reasons everything just crumbles. Oh, oh. All of those are uh, just super observations, Aiden. And uh, I, I just love what you said at the end. You know, each country and each city has its culture. And I think that's very important to recognize because a lot of innovation ecosystems exist at the subnational level and they're very different. Uh, so, the, you know, the Silicon Valley uh, innovation cluster is different from the Austin, Texas one. And, you know, Berlin is different from London. Uh, of course, those are in different countries. But if you, if you think of them as being Western European, uh, Beijing is very different from Shenzhen. And so I think that also is, is important. You know, you're not just dealing with China, for example, you're also dealing with the specifics of the local uh, ecosystem. Uh, also, you, you, you were alluding to scouting. Uh, for talent, sporting talent. Uh, incidentally, when I the first time I went to Ghana to teach at our Africa campus, I saw these flyers from uh, football scouts inviting uh, people to show up for trials. You know, uh, young uh, Ghanaian footballers, uh, which I found absolutely fascinating. But you see that same approach to big companies when they go to Silicon Valley and Israel. So they have, you know, they're engaging in scouting for startup talent uh, and they set up these innovation outposts. And actually, many of these outposts end up being very ineffective, uh, partly because they lend themselves a little bit to the innovation theater side of things. You know, this is cool. This is happening. But as you rightly said, there needs to be a very strong strategic uh, rationale for doing this. So it, it isn't to say that tapping into these other ecosystems will fail. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm saying um, when you do engage in the scouting and so on, it needs to be driven by a very strong strategy. It goes back to the why. Uh, and then, of course, applying the principles that we talked about in terms of the how, uh, and then taking into uh, seeking to, to take advantage of the of the where. So what you can do in Israel will be very different from what you can do for China. Israel is great for scouting. China may be better for scaling, for example. And, you know, then, but, but then as a multinational company that has a presence in both of these locations, then you are better placed than most to, uh, to connect the dots. Part of the issue, though, is people who work in the Israel subsidiary won't necessarily have the incentives or indeed the capabilities to engage with uh, their counterparts in other parts of the world. And so this idea that you, you have to span boundaries becomes an important one. Um, and it goes back to some of the things we said before, you know, having intrapreneurs within companies who are willing and able to span these boundaries becomes very important to realize the potential 
of tapping ecosystems in different parts of the world. It's it's such a great practical point, but you bring it to life in the book, all these different nuances that you just wouldn't think of because one of the things that happens when you're working in innovation is you're so hungry for a success story that sometimes you'll just jump at the opportunity. Oh, I got a green light. Okay, well, I'll set up over there. And you're kind of going, but you got to think about it. You got to really think about it. It's like, you need the soil to be the right soil for the fruit that you're the seed that you're going to plant, it needs to work very well. And you need to think about that. And that that can be real pain for people to go, Oh, no, not another stumbling point here, or another delay when I've just got green light. And I, it can be difficult. I can, I can, I'm putting myself into that position and going, and going, that would be a very difficult choice. Do I just set up and get going and then learn as I go? Or do I push back to the organization and go, wait a second, I need to make sure this is the right territory to set up and the right culture, the right town, the right county, all these things play a massive part in it. But let's move on. At this stage, I mean, I'm going to set, settle down with the where <laughs> I'm going to put it over there. And I'm going to think about the real goal behind this. So we talked about the why the how and the where. But there's a bigger why. And this is your own personal why, and should be the why for all of us. And this is the sustainable development goals, and how partnering with startups can actually achieve them. At this stage, I'll let you explain this part of the book. I'm not gonna I have quotes here, etc. But I thought it would be more beneficial to hand the mic to you and go about this real genuine why behind it. And perhaps it emerged as even more important during the pandemic that slowed down many of these SDGs on the planet, we were making progress not as quickly as we should. And indeed, what SDGs are, because many people won't know this and won't know the acronym. So over to you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Aidan. And, and uh, you know, in many ways, this is perhaps the most meaningful aspect of this work, I think. Uh, and during the pandemic, I think, the search for meaning has been elevated for, for a lot of people. And as you said, in 2020, when, um, you know, a lot of us found our lives completely changed, I think it made many pause and reflect on what is truly important. Uh, but it was also just so ironic that all of this happened in 2020, when the 2020s was supposed to be the decade for action uh, to accelerate the pursuit of the sustainable development goals. So now what are these sustainable development goals? I assume um, most in your audience know. Uh, but just to recap, in September 2015, the United Nations agreed upon a set of 17 goals that would be achieved by 2030. It was like a global agenda in the pursuit of sustainable development. Uh, there's no rocket science to this. Um, it's a big list. You know, you have 10 commandments, but somehow 17 sustainable development goals. Um, and actually, it's, it's basically all the things that are a no brainer to pursue. SDG one being about, uh, you know, no poverty. SDG three is about health. SDG four is about education. Uh, SDG 11 is about sustainable cities, if I think, if I remember correctly. And actually, there's a, an earlier history to this, which is in 2000, there were eight millennium development goals that had been identified to be achieved by 2015. And as we were getting closer to 2015, it was clear we were not going to achieve this. In fact, there was a, a commercial that the uh, United Nations put out where people were doing things and stopping halfway. So I think there was even Usain Bolt uh, sprinting down the track and stopping at the 50 meter mark. And, you know, the, the point was, of course, you wouldn't stop here. You need to keep going. So, OK, so we need to do this for another 15 years. Uh, and this time there was a wider consultative process. And, you know, uh, they came up with 17 goals. So that was September 2015. And, and actually, Aidan, just to um, mention something uh, of a personal nature that I actually haven't mentioned on any of the other uh, video conversations I've had. My mother, who, uh, which is where I get my Sri Lankan heritage for, uh, passed away in September 2015. 
And so I ended up going to my hometown. She died on the 20th of September. Uh, the funeral was on the 23rd. Uh, and so, you know, this was obviously a moment of, you know, thinking about what is important in, in life. And um, uh, the, the 23rd was a Wednesday. Uh, and on the Thursday and the Friday, uh, the United Nations had its General Assembly. And I think it was on the Friday that the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. And, you know, so many people had come to the funeral and everybody was talking about the kindness that they had experienced from my mother. And, you know, it made you think at the end of the day, that's what truly matters, you know. And so I think that also had a very powerful anchoring effect for me. And the 17th of these 17 goals is partnerships for the goals. You know, the idea that no one entity can do this on its own. So governments have to work together, government and civil society and so on. And by this point, I had actually been going for about a decade doing my work on corporate startup partnering. And I thought, I should align what I'm doing going forward with SDG 17, because while governments should be partnering with each other, businesses are and should continue to partner with each other. And you need this perspective, which is it's not just about economic payoffs, it's about uh, social impact too. I had also just joined um, a couple of months before that, the school that I'm at now, China Europe International Business School in Shanghai, which has a campus in Ghana. And then I started going to Ghana every year to teach. And I quickly realized that social entrepreneurship is a bit of a redundant term there, at least when my students would present their business ideas for startups. Every economic opportunity they were pursuing seemed to have a social purpose as well. You know, we don't have regular access to electricity. So I'm thinking of a solar business. You know, it's not easy to get finance. We're launching a microfinance business. And so that also made me realize that the, that the business goals and the social impact being intertwined is actually a very important and a powerful force for good. And so that um, helped me add or sort of sharpen a, 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 a focus. And this was very much on my radar. And a lot of examples that I came across in Africa uh, drew my attention to this. Uh, and then I realized that actually this is happening in uh, different parts of the world as well. I love that about when you when you develop a why it, it activates a part of your brain, the reticular activating system to spot serendipities and opportunities, and you start to see things that you didn't see beforehand. And that seems to be what happened here. But you weren't the only one. Because as you quote throughout the book, there's a there's a few quotes from world leaders, for example, great quote here from Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Now he said, real business success, in fact, capital capitalism generally cannot be just the surplus that you create for your own core constituency, but also the broader surplus that is created to the benefit of wider society. And I do feel there's an authenticity behind that. Sometimes this is a bit, you know, corporate theatre, as opposed to innovation theatre. But this cer certainly seems to be the way with initiatives like Microsoft for Africa, for example. But I wanted to highlight as well, because that experience happened to you and may she rest in peace your mother as well that experience emerged a, a, a new why or a way of seeing the work that you were doing but then you also realized that your research was bookended by two major events one was 08 the financial crash and the other was 2020 essentially <laughs> let's not talk about 2020 with the pandemic the this bookended your research but then there was more because there was three watershed global trends that were trickling through so much of the work that we were doing. The first was 08, the, the financial breakdown, but also the launch of the App Store, the digitization of the world, because everything started to change then when Apple launched the, the App Store, which was in 08 as well, many people forget. The second trend is one that you're well conscious of, because you're based there, which is the ascent of China, and also 
the view of China being um, China against the world that you talk about in the book. And then the third, which is important is the crisis of inequality and sustainability that pervades much of society. So I thought this was important to talk about as well when we're talking about the bigger why of SDGs and ultimately startup partnering. Exactly. And you know, if you go back to the summer of 2008, uh, you this, you see the seeds of all of these, you know, the, the launch of the App Store, as you said, I mean, I think that's really what then gave rise to the mobile internet and so on. Uh, there weren't apps just when the iPhone came out in 2007. But you know, uh, the App Store, I think was was the big game changer. And the, the, the rise of digitalization ever since we have felt tremendously because in many parts of the world, people have leapfrogged the PC era and gone and, and experienced the internet for the first time on their phones. Uh, in the summer of 2008, you also had the Beijing Olympics, which um, arri- uh, announced the arrival of China in many ways to a wider audience, I think, uh, but also the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the the issues are, that followed because of the global financial crisis, one of which I think is inequality, but the broader point is sustainability. So yes, I think we have experienced um, and continue to experience major forces around digitalization, geopolitics, and sustainability. Uh, and then you hit 2020 when we're supposed to be accept- So we've had five years of pursuing the SDGs up until then. Uh, and so the decade ahead is when you're supposed to move full steam ahead. Uh, but then you have the pandemic. And so these SDGs become all the more important and all the more challenging to achieve. And, you know, we're doing all of this in a world that feels a bit less global than it was before. And, you know, there are some things we cannot control. Uh, globalization in many respects may well slow down. But I think the global mindsets is still important in terms of being concerned about what's happening in other parts of the world and also learning from these other parts of the world. And, you know, I think basically a lot of companies now get it. You know, what has also happened since the book was published uh, is COP26, uh, coincidentally in Glasgow again, which is where my work began. And, uh, you know, it's very clear that business has a big role to play in this. And there is massive urgency around what needs to be done. And so even though uh, you might find global supply chains becoming somewhat less global, maybe more regional, uh, and uh, so on, when it comes to climate change, we're all in this together. And, you know, at that point, it's very difficult to say, oh, you know, we're not so sure we want to engage with China. I mean, we have to. Right. Uh, And I think corporates and startups working together represent a very potent force to be able to make progress with these SDGs. Um, You know, the first time I went to Africa, I I went to this small incubator which Google was sponsoring. uh, And it was very humbling to see this very modest kind of establishment, but a lot of appetite for succeeding. And as I said, you know, a lot of emphasis on achieving social purposes. And I met this young Canadian woman who was running the place and she'd just done a master's in development studies at Sussex University or something. And I actually felt a pang of envy. And I thought, you know, here I am on the dark side, being a business school professor. She seems to be doing what's truly important. And she said, you know, while NGOs have a very important role to play. What she had discovered was business is vital to drive the innovation that will yield the solutions for many of these intractable problems. And then I felt so much better (laughs) about what I do. Uh, And and I think that's basically the point, that uh, if we recognize that what what we do in the innovation domain can also incorporate sustainability. And I think not as two separate things. You know, it shouldn't be like there's the CSR ESG bit that happens in one corner and the corporate innovation that happens in the other. I think you want to combine the hard-nosed 
collaboration of the innovation ecosystems with this broader perspective that we need to have sustainability outcomes as well. Jameen, I, I was, <laughs> I, 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 there's so much more in this book, I wanted to talk about the partnerships you talk about in many of the emerging markets. Uh, you talked about Unilever, you talked about SAP, you talked about Bayer. There's so many examples in the book. But I felt that what you just said there is a lovely way to finish. But I also wanted to pull a couple of quotes from the book. And I normally wouldn't at this stage. But there's a few lovely things in the book that are written. One is, by the way, the, the there's a beautiful endorsement by Paul Polman, ex CEO of Unilever, and co founder and chair of Imagine. And he says a beautiful thing here. He says CEOs who quickly adopt a 360 degree view and become more attuned to their employees, value chains and wider society will maneuver with a degree of sensitivity and humanity, not open to those still focused solely on narrow financial returns. I thought that was really such a beautiful thought to plant in the heads of CEOs who are listening to the show. Because we get stuck in that loop of financial returns, the pressure, the shareholder returns and investment the next quarter, the next month, unfortunately, in many cases as well, that we forget the bigger picture. And I thought that quote brought that to life. But I didn't want to finish with a quote from Paul Polman. I wanted to finish with one from you before I hand it over to you to close today's show and this beautiful series that you've given us. You said, some of the specifics of the corporate startup partnering phenomenon will evolve with time. The nature of the dance may change. Who knows, perhaps working together may become so commonplace that a time will come when not many will need to be reminded of its potential or even schooled in the nuances of the process. In other words, as open innovation becomes increasingly in institutionalized, the market for a book like your book will may well disappear. And I love that you say that, that you actually want that to happen, you want this to become actual commonplace in organisations. And indeed, that will have vindicated efforts such as this to contribute to a better understanding of what it takes for asymmetric partners to collaborate. I thought that was a beautiful way of closing the show from my perspective. And the final thing I, I want to say is, Shireen, thank you for your time. You've done this. And I want to remind our audience in the lockdown in China, difficult circumstances, we've had internet issues, we've managed to circumnavigate your family are there with you as well. And we know what that's like for many of us as well. I know myself the difficulty of recording from home. And I want to thank you sincerely on behalf of the audience. And hopefully, many people who will be influenced by you like that lady who said it to you as well, that new information changes, new behaviors becomes new realities. And hopefully that's the case for so many of our audience who have heard you and stuck with us through this four part series. So Shumin, thank you so much. Aidan, thank you very much. Um, I have rarely come across anybody who engages with uh, material in the way that you do. Uh, and I think uh, you've actually made me feel um, like it was a worthwhile effort to have put in all that time and effort with the research and the writing of the book. So thank you for truly uh, getting to grips with what I've been trying to um, communicate. Uh, I sincerely appreciate it. I also think that a lot of what we've been talking about resonates with things that you've been saying in your fantastic book, uh, Undisruptable, and this notion that there are these mindsets that I talk about, I, I think, actually fit very nicely within the framework that you talk about, about the need for a mindset to be that where you have to constantly grapple with change, you know, the impermanence of, of, of things that you talk about, I think is very much uh, what being entrepreneurial, collaborative and global in your perspective uh, it has to do with. Uh, and so um, thank you. It's been a, a, a tremendous um, honor. And I, I do hope uh, uh, the people who uh, have listened to this have got something worthwhile uh, out of this. You, you're doing something tremendous with the innovation show. And I'm truly uh, honored to have been a small part of it. 
Thank you so much. And and uh, I, I wanted to tell you at the very end of the show, do you remember at the start I was saying I wear pins to try and reflect the show and I started off with gorillas. Uh, I started off with monkeys, actually. <laughs> and I've gradually evolved. And I didn't say anything to you, but I, I in the last recording, I had a monkey dancing with a lady. And now I have, um, it's actually the scene from Pulp Fiction when John Travolta <laughs> is dancing with Emma Thurman. So we've evolved to this point where it has all come together. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, author of Gorillas Can Dance, Lessons from Microsoft and Other Corporations on Partnering with Startups. Shamin Prashantam, thank you very much. Thank you, Ethan. Nice one, man. <laughs> Thank you for saying those kind things. Oh, not at all. Not at all. I'm going to miss that brilliant series with Shamin. I learned so much from it. Absolutely in depth research done by him over the last two decades. And I hope it pays off in big ways to help society achieve some of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I also want to thank our sponsor, Zai, who's enabling us to give you more content, to give you more bite-sized content. So I'm going to experiment with that over time. A new studio coming down the line as well. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded finance products and services, empowering business to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. See you soon.